So I'm rolling now. Jeremy, you're rolling. I'm rolling too. Sounds rolling. Fog in the night. Take yep. one. Hold on. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna mark this right in front of your face. Common marker. Okay, stand by. Okay, I'm all set. Okay, Tony, we're rolling for take one. Eugenics at the term itself originated with Francis Galton, who was the nephew of Charles Darwin. And in 1883, he coined the term meaning good and genes, or good birth, um, to actually make an argument about controlling reproduction. And Galton, controlling reproduction is something that has a long vision in uh, history, but Galton actually imagined that because of the rediscovery of notions of selection, that you could control for positive and negative characteristics. And so eugenics originated in that framework. He extended some of the work that his, his uncle had done. Charles Darwin was very careful in his work to not make an argument about the hu possibility of human control of um, selection or to, and natural selection. And in fact, it was his nephew who argued that in fact humans could control natural selection with selective breeding processes. Probably with the popularization of Francis Galton's book in 1910, you get the, the introduction of ideas around how to control hereditary breeding in the United States. 1904, there was a rediscovery, rediscovery of Mendel's Mendelian inheritance. Um, eugenics is introduced to this country. The science of eugenics coincides with a moment of concern around um, state position and the relationship between the state and individuals. Social Darwinism begins to really kind of raise its fore and you get a pullback on any kind of state investment and a notion that in fact people wind up where they are because of their innate uh, characteristics. Um, and so coinciding with, you know, a real pullback on federal government um, a real kind of notion that the individual winds up where they ought to wind up um, and a kind of boom in wealth and a boom in immigration, this scientific movement comes to this country at a moment when you have a lot of struggle around what the country is going to be like and what the future looks like. And so, in fact, it appeals initially to some individuals who have a long history of imagining that their family's accomplishments or who they are or their wealth really has a kind of capacity that comes out of their destiny. Eugenicists were especially interested in costs and um, in ways to rationalize the state and so anxiety about the cost to the state of criminal behavior or of the reproduction of individuals who might need to be in their minds institutionalized meant that they began to see um, a rationalization for controlling reproduction um, in terms of arguments around state control and state funding. There's a sort of famous family study of the Calicacs who were seen as having been descended 
from a family, a, a criminal individual. And so eugenicists would send field workers, often especially young women who were studying social intervention, to go and, and set up interviews and would collect family histories and determine then that in fact because some individual in particular had not been sterilized, you'd had generation after generation of people who committed crimes um, without a kind of understanding of perhaps the conditions in which individuals may have made decisions about how to, you know, steal food to feed their family or what kinds of social contexts you had in terms of, of understandings of criminal behavior. One of the, the issues with eugenics is there is a kind of normativizing of an ideal type. Um, this coincides with a vision that in fact you could understand different types of individuals based on their racial type, based on their IQ type, and in fact um, based on, as, as Cesare Lombroso, an Italian uh, criminologist imagined, you could understand people's propensity to commit crimes based not just on their IQ but on their facial type. And so the vision was in some ways that you could profile a population and determine whether or not somebody was likely to commit a crime. And you know, the tools for doing that were these tools that people identified as connected to genetic inheritance. Eugenicists in America actually had a couple of different kinds of ways of thinking about controlling reproduction. Some of them were targeted at restricting reproduction and restricting the population um, and who was el eligible to even come to the country. And so they were very active with the Immigration Restriction League. Um, they advocated sterilization um, policies. They created sterilization policies based on the introduction of a notion, this is along the lines of popularizing statistics, that you could rationalize and statistically understand people's intelligence. And so the popularization at the turn of the century, especially by Henry Goddard, of the um, Stanford Binet IQ test, and the notion that in fact you could give a test to someone and determine what their background or what their possibility was. Um, meant that then they began to advocate then sterilization policies, segregation policies for people who were seen as less fit or less intelligent or problems uh, with the human population as they envisioned the country ought to be developed. IQ tests were designed initially to identify special uh, populations who of genius and were adapted actually by um, Henry Goddard to apply in the United States to, um, to identify not just um, children in need of special education at the accelerated end, but also at the, at the lower end. Um, and in fact, Goddard begins to practice applying IQs at special schools that begin to emerge um, in response to a, a, a felt desire to, to reform um, American education and reform health care and opportunities. So you had the emergence, for example, of special schools targeted at um, people who could not hear, um, especially in the 1820s and 1830s, or um, individuals who would be sent to schools for the blind, like the Perkins Institute for the Blind outside of Boston, uh, which, is, which is established in the late 19th century and really sort of targets kind of a, a way of adapting education to different people's needs. Um, a lot of times then these sorts of reformatory and new kinds of educational institutions overlapped with institutions that had been set up prior to that to handle um, the poor or the insane. And so you get a kind of attempt to reform special education, but also, and, and I think IQ is seen as a, a tool for adapt, determining when somebody might need um, some kind of adaptation. The interesting thing is that there's almost no perception on the part of people who create these IQ tests on the way in which they are culturally embedded with basic assumptions. Um, so for example, some of the early IQ, the first IQ test, the Army Alpha IQ test that was masked um, applied included questions about advertising or questions about 
uh, synonyms for different kinds of animals that you would not know if you were not from, let's say, a rural background, if you were an urban um, individual. And so, or if you didn't speak English, you would still be given sort of the IQ test in English and assumed to sort of have a certain kind of response. Belchertown was the third institution. Um, at the time, there was no DMR, Department of Mental Education, Department of Developmental Services. There was no Department of uh, Mental Health. We were called the State Board of Insanity. That was the name of the board that was in charge of all the state hospitals and state schools. And uh, in, of course, 1891, we had the Massachusetts School for the Feeble-Minded at Waltham. Then in 1906, they built the Rentham State School. Uh, and then in 1915, the state uh, wanted to build a third institution and to put it out in western Massachusetts. You know, you got to remember the, the communities uh, wanted the institution. Uh, this would be a place for employment. Uh, this would be a, a place that would bring people into their towns. So uh, many of the communities actually put committees together to urge the State Board of Insanity to cite the institution within their communities. There was a, a misbelief on the part of the public, I believe, that what they expected is if they put these children into the schools that they would come out like you and I, independent and able to live on their own. Well, we know in this field, and the main intention of the school was really to help people to grow and develop to their best ability, not to make them completely independent. That would be a great goal if you could get somebody to be completely independent, but they realized that these are people who are disabled and would have a disability probably their entire life. But the schools, after, as time went on, the uh, public wanted cure. They wanted these schools to be pumping out people who could work and have families, and, and that just wasn't the case. And so they decided um, to build a nice place, a little happy village, where they would take all these people that were labeled with feeble-mindedness and put them out in a country atmosphere uh, uh, with farms and fresh air and things like that. And the purpose was really to, because they wouldn't be able to function in society, to put them in a place where they would be okay, that they, that they could do what they want to do uh, and live within the institution, that they'd be taken care of by the state. But then with the eugenics, this, this whole thing about families having defective children and um, um, that they, they bred uh, many kids and the kids would have this genetic defect uh, of feeble-mindedness and um, that they might commit crime and um, they'd be perverted and immoral and all sorts of what they call social pests. What changed the, inst the way institutions were operating is the creation of the intelligence test. Once Binet developed the intelligence test, then supposedly they had a tool to measure the intelligence of human beings. When Binet developed the test in Paris, it was really to find students in the school that needed some help and then providing that help within the classroom to help the child stay with his peers and, 
and to continue on in school. Whereas in the United States, we took the intelligence test to find people who had uh, low mental ages and then would labor them as having feeble-mindedness and therefore genetically defective. So the institutions in the beginning was to provide this happy village type thing where people could be uh, productive uh, to now we need to institutionalize people who have feeble-mindedness because if we let them stay in society they're going to breed, they're going to have lots of kids, their kids are going to be defective, they're going to cause crime, they're going to be poor, they're going to be alcoholic, they're going to beat their children, they're, they're just going to be bad uh, segments of our society. I think Dr. Fernal said something like parenthood is not for all. That some people are genetically defective and we can make them extinct. So the institutions kind of changed from let's put the person in the institution to protect them from society to let's put institutions together uh, and put people in there to protect society from them. Because if we let them stay uh, in our communities, particularly those that were labeled as moron, which were the borderline cases, um, that they would breed and would just continue to, uh, to cause misery in our society for generations to come. Uh, the institutions were built as um, actually little communities unto themselves. Uh, for example, at Belchertown, we had nursery buildings uh, for young children. We had school, uh, uh, elementary, but still schooling where people would learn how to read and write and math and, and uh, whatever. Same type of stuff you and I would learn in, in an elementary school setting, gym and painting and all that type of stuff. Um, once, uh, how they kept people productive is once you graduated from school, then you would go to either girls industrial or boys industrial to learn some type of task. And uh, then once you learned something, you would be put to work within the institution depending on what you could do. So there were some very highly capable people who probably did not have feeble-mindedness or did not have an intellectual disability, but were probably mislabeled, but um, they would augment the lack of staff. As the institution went on, um, you know, new scientific information had come out uh, regarding feeble-mindedness and genetics. Uh, it was no longer believed that like 90% of everyone who's feeble-minded is going to have a child that's feeble-minded. That got kind of went to the wayside. So eugenics didn't have as much of an impact uh, within the institution um, as a means of, of putting, of uh, institutionalizing people. Um, during the 1950s, uh, there were several things that were happening. Uh, one um, were that parents became reluctant to send their children to the institution. Um, public education started to, to happen and uh, services in the community were beginning. Within the institution though, um, the, the people, the, the, re the residents who did all the work when you get into the 50s, they're getting old. They're, they're not able to work uh, as much as they did before. And um, the people who were being institutionalized um, were people who did have an intellectual disability, which means that they would need more care. So in the 1950s, what we did is we started to take in people who did have intellectual disabilities and people who had physical disabilities. So you have people who need more care and less people to provide it because they didn't hire more staff as the, um, the, uh, the, the workers, the, 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 uh, the institutionally men and women uh, weren't able to do the work anymore. So as time goes on, you may have a building that has uh, 
maybe you know four staff assigned to it, but also has working girls and working boys that are in there to clean and put the food out and do the laundry and take care of the people. Well, when you get to the 50s and the 60s, you now have four staff people and no working girls and working boys. So you've got four people in a building with a hundred individuals, whereas, um, so you can't do the things that you need to do, um, and things fall apart. The Belchertown State School for the Retarded sits in splendid isolation on an 800-acre tract of rolling hills and woodland in western Massachusetts. The setting resembles a picturesque New England college campus, but it does not prepare the visitor for what he finds inside. What he finds are 900 retarded children and adults living under conditions that have been described as shockingly oppressive, unsanitary, unhealthy, and degrading. Conditions that are an affront to human decency. Basically, my mother gave me up at birth about 30 days later. She signed me over to the care of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She signed me over to their care and agreed to pay $3 a week for my care. And I was put in foster homes, one foster home after another and after another. And eventually, I was tested for at another state institution, and they found I had a IQ of 41 when I was six years old, and I ended up being placed at Belchertown State School. Society really didn't know what to do with these people. Uh, they were dumped here uh, rather indiscriminately. I've seen some fairly young children walking around here, some who are, well, they, they look very young, they're the very small. How young are some of them when they're committed? Right now, the policy which is in effect is that nobody can be committed to the institution under the age of six. Previously, however, they could be committed uh, at infancy, uh, and very frequently this happened. Uh, this is obviously ridiculous because there is no reliable way in which intelligence can be assessed other than uh, if there's some really gross physical deformity, uh, which we should be very cautious about interpreting as mental retardation. But there's no reliable way of assessing intelligence of a one-month-old child or even of a one-year-old child. And to doom that child to a fate worse than death and put them in an institution from that age uh, is criminal. We all ate the same kind of food out of a bowl every day. It was all mixed in together and we had a spoon to eat out of, a spoon to eat with. And so that seemed normal for me because that's all I knew and, and that kind of stuff. We heard stories that the employees would work, would eat in the cafeteria in another building, and they would eat good food. But I never saw what they were talking about. You know, like maybe real potatoes and maybe real meat, you know, uh, and that kind of stuff. But I never saw that. Mr. Knudsen, we're standing in the kitchen. Is this kitchen sanitary? Well, outwardly, I I can't say yes or no, but I don't know that I'd want to eat in here, Brad. Uh, I don't know if you would either. Mr. Knudsen, I understand the drain in this kitchen, and I wonder if this is true or not, backs up three or four times a year with sewage and... Is that true? That's true. I don't know how many times a year. I'd say probably three or four times is probably a good conservative estimate. It, it does back up periodically and sewage all over the kitchen floor, out onto the dining room floor. It's, uh, it's one of those things. Over at Cade Building, when they were doing uh, what they would do f for bathing would be they take a, uh, when I first saw this one, I was just appalled. Uh, they lined all the guys up naked against the wall in the uh, bathroom, and they took a garden hose and washed them down with cold water, and that was their bath. Nine o'clock, it'd roll around, and uh, they'd 
start having their medication and uh, e even as an attendant nurse you used to be able to uh, give out the medication without any understanding about the effects of the drugs or anything um, and uh, have access to all the medication that was in the cabinets um, and you were to know who was cup was whose and how many of these pills and there was a lot of that that uh, that was kind of mismanaged in that people didn't know really I, I didn't know what medication would do what to what people and uh, whether or not sometimes they would have two doses uh, given by two different attendant nurses or people and and sometimes Sometimes some of the worst uh, worst cases as far as cleanup and effort involved as far as uh, taking care of changing diapers and stuff purposefully they would uh, they would give them more of what they wanted uh, or what they were prescribed for or uh, give them the opposite effect so that they would be sitting for most of the afternoon just drooling in a corner. I, I forgot all about that aspect and sometimes that was because of a mistake, sometimes it was because the uh, head of the building wanted to have an easy night or day and to do that they, they would take different medications and uh, make some of the residents just uh, zone out yeah, whenever I brought stuff up like that, I, I, you know, I ended up in solitary confinement and stuff like that. So I learned not to talk. You learn not to speak up. You get a beating. You're a troublemaker. You're just trying to start trouble. So you get a beating, and you just learn to keep your mouth shut. If you didn't want to get punished, I'm going to use the word punished because that's the word in those days. Punish is a replacement for abuse. If you didn't want to be punished, you had to learn to follow the rules and and stuff like that. Another allegation is that residents are scratched and bruised and suffer from other injuries. Now, what about that? Uh, that's certainly true. Uh, residents here uh, get scratched and bruised and injured from many kinds of different incidents. Uh, most prevalent being abuse of themselves or one resident abusing another. Uh, and this is to be expected, I would say, in a, in a situation where we have people crowded together as they are and where we don't have enough activity for them, alternative activities. Uh, so they turn to this kind of behavior. Um, I know of very, very few incidents where an employee has, <coughs> has inflicted an injury on a resident. And if they do so, it would be uh, in an accident uh, where they might, for example, be breaking in to break up uh, a fight between two residents. And I'd also add that employees here are constantly getting injured and hurt, some of them to the point where they have to be out of work by the residents, uh, either in an unprovoked kind of attack that a resident might just charge an employee or in the act of trying to break up residents uh, who are fighting. You get this sense uh, that those people that even though they don't seem to be observing you or in their own world just talking, ceiling or whatever, are fully aware that you're in there and uh, as I was leaning against the wall probably 10-15 minutes in, um, one of the uh, guys who was on the floor uh, rocking back and forth, cross-legged rocking back and forth, had crawled over quietly and, and came over and just smashed into the back of my leg and uh, knocked me off my feet on the ground and I immediately turned and got angry uh, and tried to act tough, you know. Uh, it, it was a scene that I had seen in New York City uh, where it, it was just tough. It, it was just all these mannerisms and things that were taking place. Uh, you, you had to immediately act tough. and Not like I hit anybody or did anything uh, that would cause them injury, and, but I did start yelling and get angry and tried to show these guys, okay, I'm in here for the duration, leave me alone, and uh, they did. I saw 
one kid sitting on a window down in the basement where the dining room was, sitting up on a high window, and a staff person pulled him off and broke his arm, and he was still beating him up. Well, I should say attendance, because, and he was still beating him up. And his arm, you could see his bones out of his arm. Did, do you know what he did wrong? I'm assuming he was sitting up on that window. He shouldn't have been up there. All right, you mentioned last resort. There's a boy in Ward 2 of Building G who constantly wears a fencing mask. Yes. Now, why is that? This resident uh, bites off ears, literally, bites off ears. Uh, the behavior is almost uncontrollable. He's in need of a one-to-one -one kind of relationship with somebody, A, to watch him and prevent injury to others, because others do have rights to be protected, and B, to try to work with the behavior. Uh, we just don't have enough staff to provide a one-to-one -to, -one to this individual. There were bars on all the windows, and Governor Volpe came, and the legislators came down the to tour of Belchertown State School, and they went through the building, and some, they, they came, when they left, some of them, the legislators, threw up. And I said to myself, things are going to change here. They're going to they're gonna do things better for us. So they went back and appropriated money to change the bars on the windows, to take them off and put these screens on the inside that you couldn't get out. Well, we figured out a way to make a key to get that, to open that lock because it was off the gun shape and get a, we made it out of a coat hanger and we would run out, we would run out down on the bottom floor in the coat room, the guys would run out. And when you ran away, you remember it. You don't tell them how you ran away. No matter what they do to you, don't ever tell. What was the punishment for running away? Uh, two things. They made you strip down and they put a diaper on you and call baby, baby, runaway baby in the day hall and make you go around the day hall like that. And baby, 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 runaway baby. And I would have to say it, and everybody, all the other retards would have to say it. So they did that to humiliate you, and then solitary confinement. Mr. Revolio, what you say is all well and good, but there are specific charges in the suit. Uh, excessive use of chemical and physical restraint, and punishment bordering on cruelty, and having little relationship to the gravity of the offense. Now, what about that? I feel that these are situations which we have been trying to address ourselves for at least the two years that I've been here. All right, now, has there been any truth to that? Yes. What was going through your mind in solitary confinement? I was proud of it. To me, that was a badge of courage. You know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, I was proud of that because I was doing something. And it was like, a, I just, I got a medal. That's what it was for me. No, there was some staff that were nice, and there was some staff that were mean. And for me, I, I, one of the things I had to learn to do was not trust any of them. Because some staff that were nice wouldn't last there. They would be gone. They would leave. So when you get to like them, and then they leave, it's a tremendous loss. Because that's all you have. And so I learned not to like any of them. They didn't expect you to interact with these guys. They didn't expect you to, uh, to improve their, their state or the conditions. Um, you were just there just to have a body in the room. Why do you do it? Well, you know, you, can, you gotta be able to do what you can do, and that's it. Um, you, you can only go as far as... You know, uh, that you just while you're here, you just do what you can, and that's all. What is your back? Until you finally get fed up, and they just, you know, they don't quit. Or then you, you become another type of attendant in another building. I was never hot, and when someone put their arms around me, I didn't trust them. Because I figured they're going to, you know what I mean? They're going to punish me. you got to remember, we weren't allowed to hug each other. We weren't allowed to hold each other's hands. We weren't allowed to talk to girls, or hold their hands, or dance with them close. So what is left for us? 
I don't know what else is left. Uh, is homosexuality rampant here at Bowser Town State School? Uh, according to the clinical definition of homosexuality, I, my answer is no. But the acts already do occur here. Uh, sexual tension has to be relieved in some way, and when residents uh, cannot relieve them, uh, you know, heterosexually, it's got to be relieved in some way. So homosexuality is a natural. However, we have found with residents who we put into the community, when faced with the choice of having sexual relations with a male or a female, that they, if they're a male, choose a female, and a female would choose to have relations with a male. Does that mean if you got caught uh, in a, I'm going to say, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that word, but if you got caught having a relationship with another boy, a physical relationship, there was really um, serious stuff. Um, so all that stuff about sex was all like you weren't supposed to do it. You ain't supposed to think. You're not supposed to. You know what I mean? It's all not. It's not normal stuff. So we're all walking about with all this stuff in our, in our heads about things we shouldn't be doing. And I did see the boy that they took into the bathroom, and he screamed and hollered. And then when he came out, he had a diaper on, and he was bleeding in the front of his diaper. And they said they cut the tip of his penis. I have experiences from the past that still affect me today, and I have to find a way to deal with them. I felt like a retard for a long time. Um, I had to... Um, even when I was in the military, I felt like a retard. I felt like I wasn't smart enough. I felt like a retard. When my son was small, I was babysitting him. And whenever he put his arms out, to put his arms around me, I put him like this, because I didn't want his arms around me. I did that to both my kids when they were small because I couldn't stand to have anybody's arms about me. There is no question that a child raised in a good home uh, just can't be compared to a child who's raised in an institution. They, they can't compete. Uh, the institution does not allow them to get the kinds of in, uh, interaction that they need with adult figures who are extremely important to children, um, to, to get the kinds of stimulation and independence they need. And so they're dying. They're dying. Their minds are dying. If this were a private facility, the state would immediately close it down. But because we are a state facility, we are allowed to continue operation the way we are. It's, it's a matter of money, Brad, and until, until the state acts, um, they've got to act strongly. If, if Belcher Town is going to be, continue to be an institution and to house a certain number of residents, we've got to provide a minimum level of environmental factors that you and I would take for granted. All this is part of it, and the only way that the state is really going to act is if the people uh, force this action. And the, the people, the general public out here that are watching this show have to become aware of these facts and have to become active advocates for the conditions as they see here today. I think most of the people in Western Massachusetts, what was motivating was not a concern about what was wrong with institutions as much as a positive view about what, how the quality of life for people could be enhanced, enhanced if they lived in the community. Um, I think we had confidence that we would never return again to the days when institutions were snake pits and human warehouses. Well, I think most of it came from um, stuff that was being done in other countries, with Wolf Wolfensberger being the main push who introduced the whole idea of normalization and people living in integrated settings. Um, what happened is there were other people that picked up on that bandwagon in this country, the superintendent at Belchertown being one of them. And then that helped, to, that had really helped to push through the whole idea of having community settings for people to live in. 
Um, so you had some parent groups on one side saying, we don't want our people going out there, we want them to stay here. And you've got people who are in the field pushing from the other side saying, this isn't so good. A thousand people living in one place isn't good. Um, we need to find something different and pushing towards the community placement stuff. When there was um, a cadre of people who were very, very excited about the prospect, who felt that they had people in the central part of the department who would give us an opportunity to close this, that our goal shifted to um, envisioning a different kind of life for people. I think what made a big difference at Belchertown is that it had a superintendent who was willing to push an agenda. And his agenda was, we need better conditions and not everybody belongs here. Um, that, that fueled many of the changes at Belchertown State School. But without money, nothing could be done about it. So you've got somebody who, you have the idea, but then you need to have the finances to really back that idea. You can't change the conditions if somebody doesn't give you the money to go in and put in a new shower head. It's that simple. That's what it came down to. I first started working at Infernal in 1973, and it was shortly after there was federal legislation that started to create a flow of federal dollars and staffing into the state school which didn't really um, come into full flower until about 1976 when I returned there. I was in graduate school in 1973 and 74. So myself and a number of people who started in the field at that time came with the influx of Title 19 dollars. Those are dollars that were related to the Social Security Amendments of 1971, which for the first time created a federal revenue stream into the states that would offset the cost of their services in large state facilities like Fernald, like Belchertown. Um, there was not actually an analogous federal stream for community-based services until 1982, when the Chafee Amendments to the Social Security Act were passed in what's called the Home and Community-Based Waiver. The Ritchie lawsuit in Massachusetts was one of a number of similar ones that um, argued that people had their constitutional rights violated by not receiving appropriate services and uh, insisted that services be provided um, both professionally and ultimately in the least restrictive environment possible. The Ritchie lawsuit initially insisted on reform of the institutions. Most of the lawsuits of that era did that, but also really set the, the groundwork for the deinstitutionalization which occurred uh, in Belchertown starting in 1989. There were some people who couldn't wait to get out of Belchertown um, and they were ready to go the minute they met a vendor, vendor being a private agency that's going to provide services. Um, there were other people who were afraid to go out. There was one gentleman I worked with who didn't want to move into the community because if you move into the community you die. So we told him he was going to visit a place in Fitchburg, and he said, that's OK. Fitchburg isn't the community. He thought community was a place. So it was a lot of education for the people that we were working with and getting them to understand what community placement meant. You know, we'd always prefer to give both residents and families maximum choice. But um, we were limited many times in our planning because we couldn't only allow residents and families to choose where they lived because we had to superimpose on those preferences clinical judgments about who could be served together well and what kind of staffing support and clinical interventions people needed. Um, different people had different geographical preferences. Would we honor that if we could? Yes. In those cases when we could honor that preference, we did. But in order to make this complicated jigsaw puzzle work, we couldn't honor all of those things and all the variables. The options were fairly limited. What would happen is, as much as possible when um, people were leaving the state school, we tried to send them back to the community that they originally came from. Um, not exactly the community, but wherever the, someplace closer to their family, um, with the hope that there'd be more family contact once they got out. Um, in some cases, there was no more family left, or we had no idea where the family was. Um, we still tried to find uh, agencies within the community the person came out of to, to send them back to that community. 
um, towards the end where Belchertown was closing, they were, they were still trying to work with that, but then we had a group of people where there weren't, just weren't agencies or, or family that were willing in their home communities to provide services, so they ended up staying closer to the Belchertown. To the degree that we could honor preferences in geography and uh, roommates, we did. But the honest answer is that more often than not, these were administrative planning decisions in consultation with the teams who are responsible for developing people's services about what made sense programmatically. When the private agencies were opening homes, basically they would, they would buy a home, buy property, build a home, whatever, but it was a private home. Um, and when this process first started, there was a lot of resistance from community neighbors um, to the point of towns passing bylaws banning group homes. Um, that was in the early 80s that some of that was happening. And what happened in the Massachusetts is that they actually made it illegal to do that, saying that that is actually discrimination against people with disabilities. Part of it is they had no idea what somebody with developmental disabilities was like. And there had, I think many of them, associated them with people who had mental illness. They were all very dangerous, they were all crazy. People with mental retardation, people with mental illness, criminals, they were all kind of grouped. They were lumped together in the, the general mind, shall we say. What also um, pushed people's fears was some of the eugenic stuff that came out of the 30s and 40s where, oh, you can't let these people into your community. They're gonna, pre they're gonna breed and they're gonna produce more people who shouldn't be around to breed. Um, people were afraid that pe somebody with mental retardation was gonna move in next to them and they were gonna rape their kids. That's some of what we were dealing with. I think many citizens, if they don't have any knowledge and experience, with people with disabilities make all sorts of attributions and assumptions about people, who people are, including they don't make a good distinction between people with intellectual disabilities and people with mental illness. They have fears about whether people will be dangerous. Um, what you can do is, whether you do it before people move in or whether you do it after, be good neighbors, work on customer, relations and reassure people that our responsibility is to make sure that the residents moving in have a good life and a safe life and that it is our responsibility to do everything that's humanly possible to make sure that they are not disruptive to the lives of people in the neighborhood without conceding that a neighbor has a right to determine who lives in their neighborhood. As the other group homes started opening up, they actually started doing some informational things with the neighbors, the people that would be neighbors. Um, one of the houses we opened was out in Charlton, um, in central Massachusetts, and it was one of the first homes that opened as part of the phase down, and it had people who had some significant health issues. So they had a generator with their house, and part of what they did as part of trying to build the whole community is when, in the winter, that first winter, um, they lost the power out there. The house still had power. They went out and invited all of the neighbors. Come on over. We still have power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to, those kinds of things to build up neighborhood relations with people because it needed to be done. Most, most people had, at that point, never seen a retarded person in their life or never knew that they had. They may have, but just didn't know that it, the person had some any kind of retardation at all. For some people, they lost independence people who are able to walk across the street at Belchertown State School. There was a um, small general store across the street and a ice cream, summer ice cream place. There were many people that could just go over there on their own or they could walk from their building to the canteen we had on grounds without staff being with them. Again, because it's a protected environment. Those people lost a lot of independence when they moved into the community settings. Um, some of them can't even find a store without a car because it's three or four miles away. So they're totally dependent on staff to get them places. In other cases, we had people who have only minimal safety skills who, because they were living in a protected environment with a 15 mile an hour speed limit, <laughs> can't even get outside their house. They're living on a city street where the traffic is going 40 miles an hour if they're doing the speed limit, 50, 60 if they're not. Um, 
then there are people who actually have a little bit more independence than they had at the state school because they've gone from the larger living environment to a much smaller living environment where they're, at, it's, they're actually able to learn more, they're able to get out more. So while they may not have the level of independence in terms of being able to go to the store on their own, the fact that they even get to the store is new. Because there's only, there's two, for most of our homes, there are two staff on duty with four individuals living in the home. So that means that there's a lot more opportunities for them to do things than there were at the state school. I think that in the roughly 30 years since the community system really developed in full, we've had enormous, remarkable changes for people. But in historical terms, 30 years is a tiny little piece of time. There's a reason why that all happened. But I can't, you know, I got to move on. I had to learn things and stop doing those kinds of things. Because I'll hold babies now, you know. I'll hold them and let them hug me. I'll do stuff like that. I just had to learn a new way of doing things. I had to learn. And it's not so much about poor me and all that other stuff. It's about not going back to that. I don't think we could ever go back to a state school type scenario. Uh, I, my wife does have a, a special needs uh, brother who I, uh, he, he's in a halfway house and uh, I've seen the, um, the reports and things and I know that in the halfway house it's just a, a much more comfortable and more social setting than being locked in a room at the state school. We could never go back to that or should never go back to that. I think the thing that, it's an emotional way. <laughs> um, looking at people as people, drop the disability. Just see them as the individual. Sorry. <laughs> You know, drop the disability out of it, drop the preconceived notions you have, and just accept the person for who they are and build a relationship from there. Sounded like a perfect take. Yep. yep.